Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jacqueline Dorsey of Lean Frontiers and I'll serve as your host today. I'm excited to bring to you today a short webinar on Lean Supply Chain facilitated by John Kim. John Kim has been a member of the Shingo Prize Board of Examiners for over 14 years. Due to our limited time for this webinar, we won't be doing a Q&A, but the session will be recorded if you want to refer back to it later. So for now, I'm going to turn things over to John. Very good. Thank you, Jacqueline. And also, thanks, thanks to Jim at your end. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, and thanks to everybody who's uh, dialed in. We'll look forward to listening in later on uh, for uh, giving away some time and uh, uh, hopefully uh, spending some time together to um, uh, share some lessons learned. Um, the topic of this particular uh, webinar is um, uncovering hidden opportunities within your supply chain. Um, uh, Jim had first asked me if you consider doing a webinar on supply chain, and I'm glad to do it. Uh, Jim and I go back a long way. And um, uh, in a 20 minute segment, um, hold on a second here, I just got a note. There we go. In a 20 minute segment, it's uh, just a little bit difficult to cover. Um, a lot of the topics. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that uh, you guys can actually see my screen okay. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I'm going to talk, uh, talk a little bit about a certain subset of supply chain. Um, obviously with supply chain, we can talk about a lot of different segments, a lot of different parts of the supply chain. We can talk about a lot of dimensions of the supply chain. And obviously, depending on the industry you're in, um, you'll have different takeaways um, as well. And so um, I'm going to take a certain sub subset of uh, opportunities, and I guess you might want to call it that one of the things that um, 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 we've done with a lot of different organizations, and it's really, it really is the notion of, of uncovering hidden opportunities. Um, so we just think generically around what is the term supply chain. Obviously, it could be supplier to factor facility. It could be facility to warehouse or DC. It could be DC to customer, it could be plant to customer, right, all those types of things, right? Um, I like to use the concept of supply chain as being a as being a term um, as being a term that represents many systems, processes, and tools, right, encompassing both materials and services inbound to an organization and also outbound to your customers. Um, again, not quite knowing um, um, the, the different segments you're from, whether it be healthcare, whether it be discrete manufacturing, continuous flow, pharma. Um, I'll do my best to try and incorporate some examples, but um, I'll try and take the comments with a grain of salt and uh, apply them as they may fit into your particular setting. Um, when we talk about, I talk about material strategy, right? So supply chain and material strategy go together. Um, I talk about the context of material strategy as making conscious decisions as leaders and executives, right? That uh, determine the rules by which we play the game. Um, what I mean by that is. Um, all material systems, all supply chain strategies, and the development of all supply chain should be aligned with the uh, type of operation they're supporting and how they want to run that operation. Um, in addition, uh, the processes that will be used or that will be developed. Again, you know, will it be uh, will be use, will you be using Kanban? Will you be using MRP? Um, do you have the opportunity, right, uh, um, uh, to have uh, vendor managed inventory? Right? All those things are conscious decisions as part of the strategy. Uh, the tools, right? what kind of tools will be made available by the leadership team to enable those processes to work and to enable those who work inside the process to be successful? And then uh, the skills and capabilities that must be developed to make the operation run. Right? And if we can do that, right, then we can talk about performance in two different ways, operational excellence or excellence in operations, and also financial performance. Right? So I tend to separate those two concepts. The concept of uh, superior execution is what I call operational excellence, and the ability to, to impact both the income statement, income statement being revenue and cost, and the balance sheet, a la inventory, and working capital, right, are the resultants right, of that performance. Um, a, big, a big challenge for most organizations is that most organizations don't take the time to think about the material strategy. As a result, we continue to play the game with the assumption that the tools, processes, and capabilities that were successful in the past are appropriate for the future. So uh, many of you online, I'm sure, or on the webinar, I'm sure, have been involved in uh, transformations of some sort, lean transformation, if you want to call it that. 
Uh, think about the capabilities, processes, and tools that were available that your organization was successful with in the past. And how often are those same processes and capabilities the same types of things that you need as you're converting to a flow? And um, obviously the answer is oftentimes there's a big disconnect, right? So again, as leaders, we have to make those decisions. Um, I kind of lost the animation here as I'm running off the PDF. Um, uh, my Mac kind of kind of bombed out on us here. But uh, just the common concept off the right, which looks to be animated in, right? Are you going to run lot for lot? Are you going to run min max? And so on and so forth. Uh, what are your material systems, right? Material systems are the ways that the organization can choose the signal they need for materials and execute fulfillment, right? So again, there's a whole array here, and we can talk about any one of those in detail. That's actually not the direction we're going, right? But we just want to highlight some of those. We really emphasize that it's the appropriateness of the system that's selected, how you configure the system, and how you choose to integrate those systems, right? And that drive what's possible inside of operations. Um, a common failure mode, right, is each of the systems above, above, lists above, are actually holistic. And common failure modes is that uh, organizations too often implement pieces of the system. The Kanban system is viewed as Kanban cards, right? Hijunka is viewed as Hijunka board, right, that type of thing. Um, as we start talking about inter the interaction between supply chain and material strategy, there's, those, the words in italics here are actually pretty important. Uh, and by the way, um, Jacqueline will also get a copy of 85% uh, of the slides here, so um, don't really have to take notes real fast. But um, the design, configuration, capabilities, and appropriate utilization of your supply chain, right, are direct inputs to the techniques you can use to support your materials needs, right? So as an example, right, um, if you have a supplier with same day lead time, what might that enable you to do versus a supply, that same supplier having a 10-day lead time? Uh, if you have the ability to effectively mobilize and execute Kanban, what might that enable you to do in terms of replenishment compared to if you don't have that capability? And then one of the uh, most common failure modes for anyone using a high degree of uh, ERP or MRP is how you choose to configure uh, your modifiers and your parameters, right, to um, uh, to support uh, to support the operation. Um, we're talking about metrics, right? So we talk about uh, supply chain and materials performance. There's I, I put metrics in two different categories. There's tactical and operational measures, right? Exception report, maintenance, vendor on time delivery, and so forth. There's also business performance measures, right? Specifically things that impact the income statement and the balance sheet, right? And one of the, one thing to keep in mind as supply chain folks, I imagine most of you are is that the supply, your supply chain and, and the ability for supply chain to enable growth and support growth of the business actually does link you directly to the P&L on the revenue side as well, not just the cost side. Um, as we talk about materials of supply chain effectiveness, so one of the things we, we always talk about is traditional measures like to measure performance to baseline and like to measure execution of the current process. Right, and um, for those of you who are involved in lean, um, there's a little note, a little formula down at the bottom that um, I'm sure many of you have been involved with. Um, how many people should we have in this cell? And I, I use a very specific example when I ran operations. We had a bookcase cell, we had uh, 10 people in the cell. We had our Japanese consultant coming in, this is the mid 90s, right? And my, my supervisor telling me, hey, I think I did it with, with uh, nine, maybe we can do it with eight. When you actually follow the lean process, some of cycle times over tack time. Staffing came out at 3.7. And uh, my team was always afraid of the time when we actually did this calculation because we always said it was impossible. In other words, there were tools that enabled us to set a new goal, set a new goal, or set a new bar that were above and beyond what we thought was possible. And that's going to be a bit of a theme coming up on some of the next slides. Um, one of the questions that I would like to challenge you with or have you ask yourself is how effective is your supply chain strategy? Um, there's a measure that uh, I love to, love to use, love to look at, and that is days on hand of a given item versus supplier lead time for that item. If you just run that very simple report right out of your system, you will find out that there's almost no correlation whatsoever between days on hand of material and supplier lead time of material. Now, obviously, there's there's some business factors in here, right? If you are a make-to-order company or an engineer-to-order company, right, your days on hand should be very, very short, right? Something very close to the throughput time of your shop. 
right? But if you just run that report, right, one of the things that you'll say is, uh, huh, I never thought about that way before. And you will see opportunities, right? You'll see 37 days of supply of an item that has a supply lead time of three days, as an example. Uh, the next one is a uh, similar type impact or similar type of perspective. Um, what percent of your inventory, compare your inventory dollars to the actual consumption. So bear with me here, all right? Um, let's call type 1 the top 80% of consumption. Let's call type 2 the next 15% of consumption. Let's call type 3 everything else, all right? So just imagine running your inventory report, literally sorting it, highest consumption to lowest consumption. Right, get a toll on your Excel column at the bottom. I got a million bucks worth of inventory. All right, if you take, if you scroll down and you get the first eight hundred thousand dollars of, of consumption, all right, that will be type ones. The next fifteen percent will be type twos. All right, and everything else is type threes. Here's what you're going to find. I guarantee you. Um, we've done this in fifty plus companies in mul a multitude of industries. We've never had any organization better than. 44% of the inventory dollars being spent to support the bottom 5% of consumption. So what you see in front of you, right, is an example from a hospital, right, their total inventory dollars, and so you can see their usage, right, in the second column over, you can see the inventory dollars associated with that 80%. And then what does it look like in terms of how are we choosing to spend our inventory checkbook or inventory checking account to support our volume? As you can see on this slide, 46% of the inventory dollars is actually spent to support 5% of the consumption. Again, I'll say it again, we've never had any client in any industry any better than 44% of their inventory uh, being spent for 5% of the volume. Right? Some of the key points and key takeaways, right, is once you understand that information, right, you can begin to understand what's in our type threes. One of the things we say about type threes is that we do not allow writing it off or E&O as a solution to the type threes. All right, what we need to do is we need to understand how it got there. We need to, I use the term, clamp off the bleeders. That way the system doesn't replenish. All right, and we need to find a way to burn down what we have, right, to convert that inventory, right, into, uh, um, into sales, right, into, into margin. Um, uh, interesting story from a, a client in Southern California. The CFO saw a slide very similar to this and asked me the question, so you mean to tell me, John, that stuff I wrote off last quarter, we might have reordered this quarter? I said, Frank, if you didn't turn off the system, I guarantee you some of that happened. He came back to me on Tuesday or Wednesday of that, Wednesday of that week. He said, you're not going to believe this. Ten items we, that we wrote off last quarter, we actually re-triggered and reordered this quarter. All right? When we did some very simple analysis, right? so I think four of those items were min-max items. All right, so you guys know what happens there, right? So when Henry wrote it off, right, well, we probably did the right thing. We triggered a switch. We went below them in. Some got an exception report, right, or uh, an action, and uh, we went and took action on it. Um, some, some other information from a different hospital, right? Um, total inventory, $6 million, right, broken down as such. A very similar type 1, 2, 3 analysis, right? And um, if you can liquidate, liquidate meaning use, consume, temporary deviation, whatever it is, right, you can convert inventory into cash and, and, uh, and, and impact the balance sheet. Uh, just another example from a different industry, oil and gas, right, so uh, this one here, they, they wanted NA products, NA is zero consumption, but if you add it up, it's the same story, right, 49% of the inventory dollars supporting less than 5% to 5% of the sales, right. So um, uh, in terms of hidden opportunities, right, uh, uh, this is a very, very common one and a very real one that um, uh, we have yet to find any organization um, who didn't have this, this type of opportunity to pursue. Um, if some of the things that come out of a new perspective is you may then develop new tools, right? So this here is a tool that was developed in oil and gas, right, specific to being able to look at inventory by warehouse. This was uh, oil and gas uh, that had, I think, 11 different warehouses in Canada. And they all had their own type one, two, three uh, within each warehouse. Well, some type threes in some warehouses were type ones in other warehouses, right? So by again, by understanding um, the opportunity that existed, right, we then were able to develop tools to allow different uh, engineers, in this case, fluids engineers, or different warehouse managers, to see what was available 
uh, in the other locations and not feel bad about quote unquote taking their stuff. You may see some ABC in there. Um, uh, in oil and gas, they choose to use the term ABC versus 123, but uh, we stay with 123. Um, in this particular example, they burned down, uh, they identified 2.1 million in types of inventory. If you look at the top left, it was a combination of burning down existing stocks without replenishment, redistribution of stocks, substitution, right, and then also talking with other materials, uh, materials organization, organizations. There's a lot of return the vendor involved as well, but again, uh, as materials teams or materials leaders, um, the opportunity to uh, impact your balance sheet, a lot create cash. Um, is, is significant, right, with this type of approach. Um, I will add a note. Um, you, need, you do need to understand whether or not you are a cost center or a profit center. Uh, typically, if you are a cost center, you don't get a lot of credit nor a lot of reward for reducing inventory by a million dollars. If you are a profit center or if you're owned by private equity or if you're privately owned, right, so I like to joke and I say, um, uh, with cost centers, uh, finance tells you it's not really a million dollars, it's only 22% of a million dollars. If it's a profit center the comp or, or it's a privately held company, the owner says thank you for the million dollars. And if it's private equity, they say, oh my gosh, right, uh, you just reduced, right, our, our asset base. And this company is designed at a multiple of 5x, right, they take your million bucks and they start multiplying them and kind of by different numbers. So just tying back to hidden opportunities, right, that tie back to real dollars. Uh, some things to keep in mind, um, there's a direct correlation between your strategy for materials, that is, um, how am I going to set up or how am I going to approach meeting the needs of operations, the material systems you choose to select, and um, as I'm sure most all of you know, right, so that any, in any manufacturing operation, you're going to have, almost everybody has a mix of some form of lot for lot, some form of pull or Kanban, some form of min-max, some usage of safety stocks, right? Uh, there could be some of you out there that are in very high volume, very low skew environments, right, where uh, a lot of your supply chain can almost go from vendor to sell or vendor to line directly. Uh, you may not have as many variants, but um, most of you will have some array of materials, systems to meet your um, the best support operations. Um, I could have done an entire topic on sourcing strategies. Um, there are so many organizations that have struggled, that have allowed sourcing teams to become isolated, and they have a singular metric of PPV. Um, I just, I just always ask, right, that uh, you cannot give a sourcing team PPV as the only objective because they will hit it, and operations will pay the price. They got, they need to have some sort of counterbalancing balance, measure. Right, which I like to tie back to some form of a true operating cost, right? Not just landing cost. Um, too many, too many operations call uh, call things PFEP, plan for every part, but in reality, it's really just a formula copied onto every part, right? So it's really what I call it a formula for every part, right? And um, that winds up getting really dangerous as well, unless of course you have low volume, high volume, low skew, very repeatable products. And then here's a question for you as well, a reflective question. Um, most organizations actually don't have a material strategy, right? Everybody looks to survive today. You complete your list, you expedite your parts, you address concerns from the production meeting, right? Um, I would just ask that if you were to take your highest volume products in your organization or through your operation and ask yourself the question, if I look at my entire supply chain through the bill of material, right, that's involved for all of those items, I'm going backwards now here in, in raw materials, right, um, are you certain, right, that all of the items that roll into that bill of material have a material system in place that allows them, right, to be, um, uh, to support operations, right? And just a simple example, if you have a three-day lead time through the shop and you've got two or three time of, 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 uh, of castings or machine parts, have you built a material system and a supply chain strategy that addresses the delta between two weeks to get it and customer wants it in three days? All right. The good news is you don't have to fix everything to make a significant impact uh, on improvements or improving performance. Tying back to this thing called one, twos, and threes. Um, some things to do, right? What's your uh, look? Where to look for opportunity? What is your strategy for ensuring availability of supply? All right. It could be MRP. It could be Kanban. Right. Uh, um, uh, ask yourself the question, right, what is, what is my strategy? How am I going to accomplish the goal? Um, what, or, what replenishment systems are in play for your organization? Um, or are you lacking some material systems, 
right? So we work with a lot of organizations that have Kanban. They have one Kanban system in place. They think they're done. Uh, the reality is, right, that there's multiple types of Kanban, right? And uh, they didn't realize it before. But so uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail kind of story, right? And so as we uh, rounded out the portfolio of Kanban systems that were at their choice, they could then more appropriately choose and select and apply the right types of systems, right? Um, um, let's see. <coughs> Um, a lot of organizations have MRP, um, have let MRP Kanban or the IT system control what is done versus flipping around and asking the question, what do we need to do to support operations, right? And then from there, select and configure the system, right, to do what we need the system to do versus vice versa, all right? Again, that could be a long topic as well. Um, some hidden opportunities, you know, there are direct opportunities to impact uh, operating expense, and there's direct opportunities to impact the balance sheet. Um, too often, uh, the goal of we need to reduce inventory gets translated into um, don't receive anything at the end of the month, we'll receive them at the beginning of the month. Uh, if you don't understand type 1, 2, and 3, and you don't realize that half of your inventory is, is actually spent supporting the last 5% of consumption, when you give the order to reduce inventory, the only levers that purchasing has to pull is to start cutting off POs. And when you cut off POs, those are the active ones, right? So you could very, you could very easily, inadvertently, put the operation at risk if you don't know how. To, if you don't know the idea of segmenting to type one, two, three, and attacking type three to get the dollars, and then using the freed up dollars, typically, by the way, to increase uh, the inventory on hand for type ones, right? But it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a unique approach to uh, to improvement. Um, last slide here, right? Some key takeaways, right? Reflective question. Um, what's your material strategy, right? If I were to ask you to write it down for each of your, your five main product families or five main, three main product flows, how would you express it? Um, what are the key material systems that you use today, right? And are they the right ones for your business, right? Or, right, if you could have something like vendor manager inventory, I could put that to use, right? Or if you could have uh, true strategic sourcing, right? So from overseas, I could put that to use. Right. Do you have gaps in your portfolio is the question there. Uh, make sure somebody's making a conscious and informed decision of what kind of material to, to use for a given item. Um, I bet 70% of organizations we work with, when a new item is released, it's sent to somebody who's going to be the um, uh, item master coordinator. Right? And when you ask people what information they're using to actually set up the material system in play for that new item, um, there's a lot of gaps. Right, so just make sure it's a conscious decision and informed decision. Um, whatever you choose to do, do well. Right, that's the theme with every everybody we speak to. We speak to um, this idea. If you think about, um, uh, it's it's nothing for us. Um, I don't mean for this to sound uh, complacent. It's really really common for us to be able to convert twenty to thirty percent of in, of, a, of an organization's inventory into cash. Right, again, we don't we don't count E and O as success. Right. So, um, but the notion of self-funding improvement is very real. Um, make sure you develop the right processes and tools to meet the needs of your operation, right? And then this, ne this next one here is probably the most important one, learning to develop the right knowledge, understanding, skills, and capabilities of your frontline staff, right, is how you achieve operational excellence. So again, the vision, the strategy is owned by leadership. But at the end of the day, the execution is going to be happening on the front lines with those in the warehouse, those in receiving, those in purchasing, those in planning, the expediters. And if you can expand their understanding and expand, expand their knowledge base, they can become uh, powerful contributors um, uh, to your vision and to your goals. With that, I think I ran a little bit long. Um, I was trying to uh, cover some content. Um, uh, again, the uh, majority of these slides will be made available uh, on the Lean Frontiers website. Um, feel free to uh, uh, funnel questions or flow questions through Jack, Will, and Jim, or directly myself as well. And um, look forward to seeing you perhaps at AME, perhaps at Shingo, perhaps at IHI. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, John, for that presentation and facilitating our session today. And I do want to thank everybody who has been listening. I know we got started a couple minutes late, 
So I appreciate you guys for bearing with us. We had a couple technical difficulties. If you pay attention to the screen, I think it should be showing up. Um, before we close, I'd just like to bring your attention to it. Um, we're launching a new Lightwise webinar series uh, for 2016, and we want everyone who's been participating to know about it. So if you would visit www.lightwiseme.me and submit your name, you can find out what's coming up next. Also, don't forget to register yourself and your team for our first ever Lean Leadership Week. Lean Leadership Week is going to be made up of three events, and it takes place during the week of October 5th in Jacksonville, Florida. So, just to wrap things up, today's webinar is being recorded, and you can look for an email following our time together for the recording. So, feel free to share this throughout your organization. So, again, thank you, John. And thanks to each of you for participating in today's session. Goodbye.